Very nice to to be here. I used to come to Istanbul quite often, but I haven't been now in uh, several years, as before COVID time. So it's really nice to um, to be back. And uh, can you can you hear me? Uh, um, I'll hold it. And um, thank you very much for for inviting me. It's always a, a pleasure to engage with human rights um, organizations doing important work like uh, like you do. Um, given the the topic of uh, this meeting and uh, this particular speech, I wanted to um, help us think about the the networks and their purpose and what makes them work. And I would tap into um, the experiences that I had as an activist. I uh, had a chance through um, through time to be a part or initiate different networks. And I have some learnings from that, some um, successes, some failures, uh, some ideas on uh, what might work and what might not. Um, so I basically wanted to to share that with you um, today. Please uh, feel free to stop me at any point uh, uh, if I'm not being clear about a certain idea I'm putting forward or um, anything, just please raise your hand or uh, yell um, and uh, and we'll focus on that a bit more. Um, I'm not going to go into introduction because Alan John did a very exhaustive uh, presentation already, um, but what I would like to say in the beginning is just to mention a few networks that I was working with just to give you a, a bit of an idea of uh, the experience that I'm sort of tapping into uh, when when discussing these few things that uh, I received as inputs for um, for this talk. So uh, the the first network that I was engaged with was when I was still in high school, and I grew up in a small town in Croatia that suffered greatly during the 1990s war, and my family, like most of the community, fled the town during the war, and when we came back, it was obviously devastated, not just physically, but also socially. And there weren't many opportunities for uh, young people at the time. And uh, partly because I was bored and partly because uh, I did want to change that situation for myself and, uh, and my community as well. I got engaged with some human rights organizations um, early on when I was still in, in high school. And the first organization I worked with was the Croatian Helsinki Committee for Human Rights. You all or most of you know about the Helsinki Act for uh, Peace and Cooperation in Europe and the movement of organizations that emerged um, out of it. Uh, there's a number of Helsinki committees still existing Europe-wide, some of them transformed in the meantime to catch up with the times, such as, for example, the Swedish Helsinki Committee is now um, Civil Rights Defenders, and uh, um, Human Rights Watch was also in the beginning the Helsinki Watch. So it's it was part of this wider movement around the, the Helsinki Act to promote peace and collaboration in in Europe, and the organization in Croatia was at the time basically a leading uh, human rights organization, and I got engaged in projects that supported education uh, of young people around human rights and around activism. I joined because I wanted to learn how, you know, how a kid from a small town can potentially instigate certain social change, um, and uh, the committee was part of this network, so some of the the experiences around networks I have are from the Helsinki Committee, but I also, with my colleagues from um, countries in the region, from Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and so on, set up a small regional group of uh, what we call the Helsinki Committee Youth Groups um, to support each other, to learn together. We were all very young, and the reason why we um, connected in the network was largely to enable our learning, 
to uh, build ourselves up in people who understand what organizations are, how they work, um, how you advocate social change or uh, fight for the, the protection of certain right or uh, um, try and devise a certain opportunity. Um, later, I uh, set up the Youth Initiative for Human Rights in Croatia. Um, but I was not alone in that. It was at the time when sister organizations already existed in other countries in the region, namely in Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Montenegro. And um, with this network, I basically spent uh, a decade of my life uh, uh, working with them. And this network had a specific purpose uh, because what was often problematic is uh, when, when in Croatia, I would, for example, stand up for the rights of Serb minority, uh, very many people would see that as sort of a treacherous act against Croatia. Like uh, when, when I would speak about crimes that Croatian forces committed against Serbs uh, during the war, I would often get a response, but what about the Croats? Um, what about the violations that Serbs did we were just defending ourselves and so on and then having a sister organization in serbia that speaks about the responsibility of serbia uh was really useful for me to show and say well i'm raising what refers to the responsibility of my institutions but i work with people across the border who are raising uh questions about the responsibilities of their institutions and their state and i felt throughout my time of working with them that uh, being a network in that sense brought a lot of legitimacy for what we were saying. You cannot say that I disregard a certain aspect of the problem if I'm actually actively and intentionally engaging with people who are addressing that issue specifically. Uh, so in the first case, it was largely about learning and building something uh, from scratch in the other case it was mostly around uh, legitimacy that the network brought uh, the third network i worked with a lot uh is called uh, recom uh, which is short for the regional commission it was uh and still is an initiative to set up a truth and reconciliation basically commission in the in the western balkans and uh a few people who started this initiative recognized in the beginning that uh it's going to be an uphill battle that there is no uh, significant support from politicians throughout the region but we wanted this commission to be set up by states so that it's formal and so that it enables um formal collaboration around dealing with the past around fact finding between the states of former yugoslavia and uh we managed to mobilize a movement of hundreds of organizations and thousands of individuals to join in. So that network did not have as much of a purpose around learning or legitimacy. Its purpose was around instigating and supporting and coordinating collective action about a mutual interest, something that we all cared about, wanted to do, but were very, very conscious that no individual or individual organization can do it themselves. Even with hundreds of organizations and thousands of individuals, we still have not succeeded. This started in 2005. We still don't have the, the commission, but I still think that uh, how far we got would have been absolutely impossible if it was just a handful of organizations or one organizations do, organization doing it instead of this wide engaging inclusive uh collective action um another network um i wanted to to mention is uh the international coalition of sites of conscious uh they're based in new york but also have regional uh, groups such as the european network for example and uh the reason my organization at the time the youth initiative joined this coalition was that we had this initiative for a museum dedicated to civilian victims in my hometown. Usually, uh, 
throughout the, the region of Western Balkans, states t- t- tend to commemorate fighters. And if you go around, you're going to see a lot of monuments and commemorations for soldiers who have been killed in the war. But you're going to find much less um, focus on civilian victims. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that fighters tend to be ethnically homogenous more than civilian victims. When you look at my hometown, for example, both Serbs and Croats, civilians were victims of, of crimes. But if I choose to commemorate soldiers, I'm obviously going to commemorate only one side. Uh, and uh, our sense was that uh, as part of reconciliation, we have to recognize this humanity in everybody and uh, make sure that we don't discriminate when it comes to to victims and experiences of, of victimization and wanted to set up this uh, um, museum dedicated to civilians regardless of their ethnicity. Um, but we realized that it takes so much knowledge and resources and so on to even start thinking about what the museum could look like, what it could capture and so on. And then we found this network, which is sort of a resource network. They gather different museums, different sites of memory, of commemoration, sites of conscious, and build um, basically piles of resources that you as an organization can use to bring that bridge, that knowledge gap uh, that you as an organization have. So in this network, the, the purpose was in a way capacity building around a certain issue and having this uh, benefit of um, engaging with those that went through what you're going through now. Uh, and the, the last network I wanted to, to mention is the network of social entrepreneurs. Um, when I worked with this uh, uh, Swedish uh, foundation that supports social entrepreneurs that contribute to human rights, that they recognized at some point that just having the relationship between the foundation and social entrepreneurs um, is, you know, has, has its specific ways of working. Because one thing you have to recognize, and that always is the power imbalance in a sense. Let's two of us be in a network, but I'm the funder and I'm giving the, the money and you're sending me reports, but let's pretend that we're equal. Um, but what ended up working much better was to connect social entrepreneurs with themselves and make sure they are able to communicate kind of more horizontally, exchange ideas, exchange learnings, support each other, find commonalities, and so on. So it is on the basis of these several examples where each network had a different purpose um, that I want to discuss some of the the questions that I received from from uh, the organizers. And uh, these questions are, why are networks important? Um, in a way, what, what makes networks important, especially when thinking about issues such as democracy and active citizenship. So these huge issues of uh, uh, social change. Then a question of what brings networks together. Um, and I know that so there is solidarity in the title, but I'm actually going to, in a way, speak against the notion of solidarity and more around the notion of mutual interest. I'll explain that in a, in a minute. Um, then, uh, then there's a question of what makes networks work. Um, what are some of the, the preconditions, basically, that build uh, a successful or um, a network that works for both itself and um, and its members, and they also included some technical questions around financing and communications and so on. So I'm going to address those um, briefly a bit as well. I'd like to start with the reasoning for networks and around this hook up solidarity and interest. Um, it doesn't have to be true for everybody and your experience might be different. But in my experience, I found that 
solidarity is something that can bring people together around a certain issue, but it's not something that is going to make them stick around and support each other sustainably. Um, I found that if we're engaging on the basis of solidarity simply, uh, then it's going to last as long as I have the capacity and willingness and focus and so on to nurture that solidarity and, you know, take away my time and effort and so on that I would invest in issues that I'm working on or that I care about more to support you. To me, solidarity has also this implied imbalance in either power or a situation. It's one thing when people in, in peril or in the same struggle are coming together to be a stronger front. But it's different when I say, you know, those poor people in XX country or community, let me, you know, go and help them. I'm a person who's in solidarity with them and so on. And it often takes this form of, of posturing in a way. So my sense is that solidarity is not the ingredient that keeps networks together. Solidarity is what brings people together, but what keeps them together, I think, is mutual interest. Uh, if, if you and I have a relationship in which I'm always receiving and you're always giving, it's only going to last uh, for a limited period of time, as I said, as long as you have the, the willingness and focus to do that. But if we have the kind of relationship where uh, we build a certain network structure, uh, relationship as such, where I'm getting a certain benefit, it's helping me in certain ways be more effective in what I'm doing or helping my learning, helping develop me or, or just be a stronger civic actor and it's helping you as well, then that's going to make us stick together. Um, it's going to help us recognize that this engagement is mutually beneficial. It is helping both of us and we're both incentivized to keep investing in it for as long as, as that holds true. Uh, so I would very much, um, I don't want to, I don't like to give advice, even though my positions are often advisor. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I do like to, would like to give this input that when you're thinking about the networks in which you're engaging, ask yourself what is the interest, uh, what is your interest for engaging in that, and what is interest of the others from you joining. Um, we tend to think of the word interest as a sort of a, a dirty word, something that emerges from capitalist tradition or so on. But I think it's in, in human nature. We all, you know, uh, the, the rights and liberties that we have are our interest. And I don't think it should be a dirty word. And I think we should all, especially when you lead organizations or programs and so on, I think it's part of your job in a way to consider your interest, your organization's interest, and the interests of those on the other side so that you can find that place and that relationship that works for both. And um, at least in, in my experience, that's one of the key ingredients for, for networks to actually, um, actually work. When, when we think about the mutual interest and what it could be, um, I think there's a few things that transpire as reasoning for, for networks to exist. One, like in the case of this Reckham, that I uh, mentioned, you want to build a stronger front. You know that as an individual or as an organization, you can only go so far, that you have limited capacity, uh, that you're already burdened with other things that you're doing. Organizations tend to tackle multiple issues or the same issue in multiple uh, environments and fora. Uh, so focus in that sense is uh, um, is really important to facilitate people coming together around uh, a shared interest, a shared objective, 
to build a stronger front, to make ourselves more effective and stronger before the government, the public, especially when it's about issues that are controversial and that many people don't agree with, which is often the case in human rights uh, or rights-based advocacy. The second thing uh, um, that I think is really important uh, as part of the reasoning for networks is a challenge around tactics. Uh, what I see often in civil society, and I'm sure you see it too, is that people are doing a certain program or certain initiatives. And you ask why, and they tell you, well, it's an issue that I really care about, it's an issue that's problematic in many ways, and so on. But they often cannot tell you why they're approaching it with this specific tactic or this specific approach. And uh, it's clear, I mean, partly it's clear why that happens. Funding is limited, uh, the, the space for reflection of how we do stuff is limited. You have to chase project from project to make sure that, uh, that you keep the organization running. But what the, the big social issues that we're addressing actually take a lot of thinking about the strategy and the tactic of how you're going to to approach it. And also context changes, everything changes, the government changes, the composition of parliament changes, the um, social attitudes change and so on. And organizations have to not just navigate those changes, but ideally also see the trends uh, that are emerging and materializing and then check in around their strategies and tactics. What I found at least again in, in my experience is that uh, when you're acting as a lone organization in that sense, you're not going to be questioning your approach often, especially if you have any positive feedback um, from those you, you work with. Um, you're going to try and seek more sustainable relationship with donors, and let's say a certain donor supports... <laughs> I don't know what that was, uh, that a certain um, the donor supports a certain type of intervention and you have a pretty good understanding that as long as you continue doing that, you're going to have a support for that. So ultimately you come to the point where it no longer matters where, whether it works or not, but it works for your organization because it gives you some uh, some resources to, to do your thing. What happens I find in networks is that, uh, people tend to discuss why are you approaching this thing this way, or you're often going to notice in civil societies that if there's two organizations addressing the same issue, they are going to have differences in opinion and approach in whatever. Uh, I think that's a double-edged sword. Because in one, on one hand, obviously having a diversity of opinions is better for everybody. It helps us challenge uh, different ideas, uh, different things that we believe and helps us get to, to better solutions. But at the same time, it wastes energy. And if you, know, you and I have an organization working in the same area and you're pulling in that direction and I'm pulling in this direction, we're both going to be weaker for it. But if we come together around these differences and find common ground and find compromise and then start pulling in the same direction, that's going to make us stronger, but it's also going to make us more effective than you or I would individually be. Um, so I think this aspect of challenging the approaches and actually reflecting on why we do things in the way that we do is what necessarily happens in networks and is one of the big arguments in that sense to to nurture networks with people who are like-minded in principles but might not be as like-minded in, in approach. The third thing I wanted to uh, mention as part of the reasoning for networks is capacity. We always have limited capacity. And uh, I've never seen a civil society organization that uh, with any reasonable analysis has sufficient capacity to address the social problem it's actually addressing. 
you know, you're going to look at state into institutions and, uh, and an institution with a very narrow mandate is going to have hundreds of employees, uh, millions of dollars in um, the funding, buildings that they use, the cars, whatnot. And then you're going to see uh, an organization that works on, I don't know, eradication of torture that has four employees. How are they going to how are they going to do that? There's always a shortage of capacity in that sense. So what I find is that uh, when organizations come together around a, a, a shared interest or a shared objective, we can pull our capacity, the, the limited, it's still going to be limited, but it's going to be incomparable to every organization individually. And what I find from found from experience that works in a way is that uh, when organizations count on long-term uh, collaboration through networks, because um, if if I'm supposed to fill out different positions of different expertise and so on, and you're doing the same, we're gonna be in direct competition with each other for the little talent that there is because we know that also civil society is losing the, the brain power often to international organizations, to corporates, to uh, whatever. Um, so I find that long-term co collaboration is conducive to, you know, sitting down and saying, how about you hire a person who is really strong on external communications, and I'm going to hire a person who's really strong on research. And I'm going to build the research capacity and you build the external advocacy capacity instead of both of our organizations doing both and then ending up with none of us doing it well enough. Um, so I think there is something around this pooling of capacity and maximizing the capacity that we have, which can happen in networks, especially when they're longer term and when they're based on, um, on mutual trust. And the last thing I wanted to uh, mention around the, the topic of reasoning for networks is the question of legitimacy. I explained, uh, hopefully, um, around the case of the youth initiative in Croatia and Serbia and how it worked. Um, but I think it, it's also applicable beyond that. Um, people tend to, the public and the political sector, often tends to see some of the human rights advocacy issues as radical, as extreme, and so on. You, in a, you know, in, in my own country in the 90s, if you would say all Serbs have the right to life, that would actually be an, a very controversial statement. Such a basic thing. And that happens, we all experience it in human rights defense, that's something that's absolutely foundational in common sense can be perceived as extreme, as radical, uh, as very controversial. So I think that when people come together in bigger numbers, who have legitimacy in their communities on different levels, um, when people join forces from different backgrounds, uh, that that's going to help legitimize each uh, of the participants of that movement in the eyes of the public or political sector or the media or whatever it might be. So I think it's very valuable when building networks or, um, or developing them further to think about this aspect as well. Uh, how can we contribute to each other's legitimacy in the specific context that, uh, that we work in? I wanted to just briefly refer to these two technical issues around communication and and funding before closing around um, what I see as preconditions for successful networks, which is what I wanted to, in a way, give as an input for the panel taking place after lunch. Uh, the question I got from organizers is why is it important to have equal voice or a, a visibility of members within networks? And my sense is it's not. 
I think what's important is that uh, um, networks are built on trust, that they're built on understanding of everybody's interest, and that people have the not just the, the, the right or liberty, but the actual effective avenues of putting issues forward. If that means that I'm not going to uh, speak in two meetings because I don't have much to to contribute to, um, I don't necessarily see a problem with that. Maybe there's going to be a third meeting that I'm going to organize around the issue I care about and I'm going to be speaking most. Um, I think a lot of networks, in a way, suffer uh, from this idea of um, artificial equality in a, in a way. I really think it's important for us to uh, not get caught up in these um, in these symbolic notions that often mean um, mean nothing. Um, I think it's more important to to ask ourselves: Is there anything that we are doing as a network or as an orga organization that is alienating someone we don't want to alienate? That is not building a conducive platform for people to come forward with their interest. As long as you're not doing that, I think you're doing quite a quite a good job. I don't have to speak just for the uh, the reason of speaking, but I have to know that the network that I'm a part of is a forum in which, if I have something to say, I can say so without uh, without issues. Um, so when it comes to, to communications, I think my input would be, be mindful of that. Think if there's something in your structure, in your approach, in the way you communicate that is not inclusive enough for others, that is preventing them from, from engaging, um, not necessarily count the words and minutes that, uh, um, uh, people speak in that sense. It's fine that there's imbalance in in that sense as long as everybody is invited to um to participate and free to do so and when it comes to issues of financing and uh, the organizers asked me whether bureaucratization of networks is a good or a bad thing um i think like with most things in life it's a question of balance uh if the network is too vague and doesn't really have its rules or its procedures, I find that often to be quite exclusive, actually. You know, if 20 organizations have a network and it doesn't really have, it's not bureaucratized at all, it's completely free-flowing, and I come in as a new member, how am I going to catch up with the uh, practice? Because what it relies on is... Uh, previous relationships that you already had and your own organizational memory in that sense, which I don't have as a newcomer in that sense. So I find that having some level of bureaucratization around procedures, how we meet, how we discuss things and so on, is useful and actually quite conducive for the dynamism within the, the networks. But of course, uh, uh, I say that it's a question of balance because there's uh, many things uh, that are incentivizing us to be overly bureaucratic. Like the, this project is funded by the European Commission. European Commission is notorious for that, obviously. And we know how much resources bureaucracy can sometimes drag away from the actual focus on what you want to do. All of us would rather be out with people and doing things that we believe in than sitting in front of computers writing reports for bureaucrats in Brussels, right? Um, so I, I really believe there's a, there's a certain balance and uh, there's no other way to find that balance but through conversation and attempts and failures. You try with a certain level of organization and see how it goes. And uh, I believe that naturally it's going to come to to something that works for uh, for the network. Um, so I think it's uh, it's really important. Similar with communication, 
when it comes to the bureaucracy, the rules, the procedures of networks, to be mindful about what they're enabling and what they're preventing us from doing. And then in view of that, find a balance that works for for members of the network. Uh, and then in, um, in closing, I would like to um, discuss what I see as preconditions for successful networks on the basis of uh, uh, or what I spoke about now as well. The first thing I think uh, networks require is focused organizations who know what their purpose is and what they want. If you gather organizations that, you know, are today dealing with the green stuff, tomorrow with women's rights, the next day with, uh, I don't know, sustainable development, you're not going to be able to to build a sustainable, functional network with these sorts of organizations. The number one ingredient, I think, are focused organizations that know their purpose of existence and know what they want to achieve. Because then they can say with uh, much more clarity, this is what I need to, to make this work more effective. Uh, in order for me to progress on advocacy of rights of this certain group, I need this kind of knowledge, this kind of support, uh, this kind of visibility and whatnot. And then they can uh, figure out and articulate within the network what role the network can have in meeting those those rules. So I really think that organizations that know why they exist and what they're doing and what they want to achieve is the number one most important ingredient for successful networks. The second that I won't elaborate much on is a bit because I already mentioned is the mutual interest. I do think there needs to be something that brings us together and something that keeps us together. Uh, I'll just repeat this part. If you have the imbalance in the relationship and someone that's always giving and someone that's always receiving, that's not going to last for long. No matter, no matter how much we felt to be in solidarity with each other or how much I understand the, the plight of that organization or, or community it defends, there needs to be an articulation and understanding of the interest at the level of organizations engaging and at the level of the the networks. The third thing is, I think, is uh, patience and compromise. Collective action takes effort, takes time, it takes nerves. Um, so it definitely takes patience. No, and you know, when you all know how difficult individual relationships are, just think about different individual relationships that you have in your life. Having relationships between organizations that are already within themselves complex or uh, organisms of complex people is not easy. So I think if, if you're going to approach engagement with others without sufficient patience, without readiness to compromise, not on principles, of course, but compromise on how we do things, what we prioritize in a certain time and so on, it's just not going to work. Or you're going to get the kinds of networks where you have the bully members that get their ways and the others that sort of follow and live through it. So I really think and would encourage that when you're engaging, you approach it with, uh, with understanding that it is going to require patience it is going to require compromise. And I found that it's useful then for individual organizations to think, okay, I'm engaging with this network because this is what I need and I think this network can help. But also understand what is the range of what's acceptable for you. Maybe I don't get 100%, but maybe 30% is already a big contribution to my organization or my cause. Uh, the next thing, and very related to, to the mutual interest, I think we need, every network needs to find a way that it's not a zero-sum game and that uh, we are in some sort of a win-win situation. What I, uh, what I found as well often is that uh, 
some people are going to initiate a formation of a network around a, a very important cause that multiple organizations care about. But what's going to happen in practice is that instead of this network uh, building up the capacities of the organizations that participate in it and the cause, what's going to happen is that organizations have to invest the very limited resources that they have in building up this network. And the network might not uh, serve them back. Um, and that's not just unsuccessful, that's also dangerous because it's to an extent paralyzing the, the organizations that are already too scarce of a resource to address a certain issue. So I think there's uh, really a need to discuss this mutual interest and think about how this network is going to be maintained, who's going to deal with the organization of stuff, how we're going to fund it, how are we going to deal with the preconditions in a way that doesn't take away capacity from the organization that's already limited, but actually helps us maximize capacity and come to the situation that's win-win. Uh, the next thing is similar as with the organizations. Uh, the network needs a clear purpose as well. Um, when I presented a few networks in the beginning, that's why I wanted to say this network had this purpose for me or for my organization. Um, I think it's really important to be clear on that um, because otherwise they can easily be hijacked and go in different directions. And the very last thing I think needs to be there is the belief from everybody involved uh, that there is a potential for us to succeed. You might be, you know, David against the Goliath in, in the struggle that you're pushing for, but there, there needs to be at least some belief that we can succeed to an extent. If that doesn't exist in a network, uh, my experience is that it's going to be become dry, become technical, become energy wasting instead of a place where we encourage each other and where when we leave the, the meeting of the network, we leave it with sort of a renewed sense of optimism rather than a sense of, of feeling hopeless. So I think there is something in this belief that we are stronger together and can push whatever it is that we're pushing further that we can individually needs to be there for networks to work. Uh, this is what I had to to share. I hope it's uh, um, it's useful. Um, I know there's going to be a panel about the similar topic, uh, and uh, um, I hope this provides some uh, some useful inputs. As I'm sure you're all navigating where and how to invest the the capacity that we have and what role um, networks would uh, would have in that. And uh, if uh, if I'm choosing a parting message, it would be to to stand up for yourself and your organizations and look at networks from that lens. Solidarity is nice, as I said, but it's not going to it's not going to make us stick together, making sure that we understand why we're working together is. Thanks a lot.